Welcome tonight. It's Pastor Kevin from uh, New Testament Church of the Firstborn. I am uh, coming to you in the streamcast of the Gathering Echo, and we uh, have a really, really good uh, message to give to you tonight. So if you have your markers and your Bibles, you probably want to be close. We're going to look at uh, Hebrews chapter 2, and we're going to see a recurring theme that has passed down through the Scriptures. And uh, Paul, which we believe to be the writer, of course there are many different people that say other things, but for the present, through the Holy Ghost, God chose a man named Paul to help the Hebrews to cross over into the real Christ and the Messiahship, which is their salvation, with God loving all of mankind. And he restates a question. And we're going to begin in chapter 2, verse 5. And it says, uh, For unto the angels he hath not put in subjection the world to come, but one in a certain place testified. And we see a statement by David in Psalm 8, verses 4 and 5, that what is man? That God, you set your mind on him. What is the intent? What are you thinking about? I remember uh, our minister and evangelist, uh, Scott Reed, that he preached years ago that we should consider that we've been considered. And we are the thought life of God in reality. We are the manifestation of God's energy, God's thought, God's, in, God's design, God's intent, because mankind is Godkind. All of mankind is a representation of what God had desired to reveal Himself in the crowning of creation. On that sixth and final day, man was created for a seventh day of sheer fellowship, of spending and recreation with God. And now we see that the recreation is restored through the recreation of the regeneration of remembering where we originated from. We are the offspring of His Spirit. And everything brings forth of its own kind according to the pattern that was written in Genesis 1. So what is man that God would be mindful or thinking? We want God to honor the fact that we think about Him and it's the fact that He thinks about us that makes that a cyclical, a cycle, or creates a communion, of meditation, prayers to God, because we know we're heard, meditation, because He knows our thoughts, He knows our downsetting and our uprising. There's not any word in my mouth that God doesn't know it all together, Solomon said. And now we see that prayer, uh, uh, that communion, that meditation, and then at the highest expression of our emotion and thoughtfulness as we feel the transcendent Spirit of God touching us and anointing us worship. And this is in the core of our being, in the trichotomy of God's Spirit, which also has purpose, and consciousness built into it. So he asked the question, What is man? God, that you've been mindful of him. Question, Or the son of man, that thou visitest him. Thou made him a little lower than the angels. Angels, Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. I did a very short study today, and these are the very broad ideas of what God had in mind by thinking of man and making man, according to Genesis 1.26, when he had a discussion with all of us that we should be the manifestation of God's image and that we should live in the virtue of good fruit and that man, the temple that he's created us, our bodies, the temple of the Holy Ghost, would be the seat in the center of what he would call his temple, and that's where he would place dominion. Now it's in that dominion that I went all the way back to Job 
And in so doing, I wrote down some questions that Jesus came and answered for you and I. And that will begin to be answered in Hebrews chapter 2. In Job 7, 17, what we consider one of the oldest or older books of the Bible, uh, something that, if it's old as they say it is, Moses had it as a book or as a oral story to talk about, passed down uh, in the descendants of, of Esau and others about this man named Job. Uh, and Abram living, Abraham living to be 175 years himself, spending his last 38 years with Hagar, which we know by her name is Keturah, and having six more sons. So with Keturah, which is Hagar, they also had Ishmael. So they had a total of seven sons, and he only had one son with uh, his wife Sarah. And of course, we know him to be Isaac, that promised uh, only begotten of that marriage and union. Nevertheless, we find that Job in chapter 6 is in a terrible grief because of these bloody, runny boils, whatever he had contracted, that had brought him down to sackcloth and ashes. And it's in a terrible grief of his humanity that he begins to lament ever being born or through the pain and the suffering, he begins to ask several questions. And he posits the idea of what is man? Uh, why would you magnify him? Interesting. Job would ask God, why would you even seek to magnify man? Because the magnification of God, the magnification of man, is insight into God our Father. And remember, under the New Testament theology that Jesus taught, He now has become our Father. And we all are sons and daughters of God. So like the firstborn, we should not think it robbery to be equal with God, Philippians 2, 5 said. But yet this is a major struggling point. Religion won't touch it. You'll be labeled, cast out, run down, as Jesus was, because they constantly said in his time, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, that you're a man trying to make yourself God instead of God who literally manifested himself as man. And this is something we want to achieve tonight. We want to see if we can even approach the design and the intent of our Heavenly Father and live in what he promised us. Now, it's amazing the way that people will shy away from this because we fear the church more than we fear God. We fear man, and when you fear man, Solomon said, that brings a snare. Oh, they might cast your name out as evil. They might say you have a devil. They might say you can't be fellowshiped. He's gone into spirituality. Well, I hope so. I hope I've gone into spirituality. I hope I'm recognized as a spiritual being because my Father is a spirit. God is a spirit and that's how I worship Him in spirit and in truth. So why would you magnify Him? These uh, 17 things that I found. Did God set His heart upon Him? Yes, He did. Mankind. Did God say that man should be clean? He said he should. Was man born of woman? After Adam, yes. Eve was named because she was the mother of all living. Now we know that the woman carries a significant qualification in the unity of the faith that every time she gives forth uh, birth to a child, she is providing redemption to herself and continuation to the kingdom commandments, the five kingdom commandments given in Genesis 1, and that is to be fruitful and to multiply and replenish the earth. This used to be such a great idea that in the older days, if you were in a Jewish family, the custom was if an older uncle or a relative had passed away, the next child, male or female, 
would be named after the one that had passed away. So the identity and the name of the person can live on through God, through the family, continuously through the earth and begin to establish a infinite, unbreakable cycle of life that in itself can be thought of as eternal and everlasting. And that's just an older custom that some people are no longer aware of. That man should be righteous. Is that true? Yes. That God is mindful of him. Yes, there we are in Psalm 8 now. As we progress into uh, Psalm uh, 15, it goes on that God is mindful of man, that God visits him, and that God made him a little lower. Now your King Jimmy says a little lower than the angels, but the correct word, if you look it up in the Hebrew, is Elohim. That man in sin, unthoughtful in, in his dark thoughts, has become a shade lower than God Himself. So the equality was always the standard. Being one with God, being equal with God, magnifying God, and living as gods on the face of the earth is what Psalm 86 says and what John chapter 10 clearly ratified through the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did I not say ye are gods? So in that Psalm 82, we find that it was always God's intention to put us at the same level of presentation, magnification, love, glory, and grace, and forgiveness as our Father Himself is. As many fathers on the earth will tell a son, when are you going to start acting like my son? When are you going to start acting like you did come from me? Because we want that uh, alignment to be in our offspring. I think God wants that same thing, even that much more. And thus He represents uh, what it is to be called, what, what it is to be uh, chosen, what it is to be uh, elected, and what it is to be ordained by God, which are all of those are markers in our journey of faith as His children. When it comes to God the Father, the timeless one, yes, we are represented in the childlike and as his children. I'm his child. Yes, that's true. So you made him a little lower than the Elohim. You crowned him with glory and honor. Well, that's interesting. God does crown us with the honor of the anointing. And as I drink down another swig, he crowned us through the crowning of Christ with glory and honor. Now we live in the hope of this glory, that we have access through faith into, into this grace where we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now that access was given to us through a measure of faith. That measure of faith gives us access. This is the beautiful truth that God wants to reveal through us because we are Him and He is us. That's why it behooved Him, Christ, to be made like unto His brethren, born of a woman in the fullness of times, what God talked us into in Genesis 1.26. The time came that God said, it's my turn to come and take on an earth suit, take on a soul that's just as normal as any other human being, take on their bone and their flesh and come with the redeeming blood of heaven and be tempted in all points and show them that through the Holy Spirit you can live the life that Father has in mind and in intent and in design this trichotomy of power in truth through the competence of the grace of God. And that competence is what's in our hearts today that competence to find a way to love someone, to find a way to love uh, those that are challenging, those that are our enemies, those that are seeking evil. We're not overcome with evil, 
but we overcome the evil with good. Now this is called the competence of God's grace. Now we have unfortunately in the Pentecostal church labeled it power, 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 where many people in religion today are on a power trip and now they're not loving. They're more about what they call the power of God than they are the love of God, thinking that power manifests love. No power can ruin love, as knowledge can ruin charity. Because knowledge is such a risky thing, they're not even worried to be compared in the ending definition of love. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 that knowledge vanishes away. That when you look at what knowledge is, tongues have to stop long enough for you to quit the death language and learn the life language, and prophecy can only take you so far until you meet Christ. He's in your heart, and you begin your journey and walk in reality with Christ the Messiah, our Savior. Yes, to me, He's Jesus Christ. And that is the manifestation of God my Father in a bodily form known as the Son of God and the Son of Man. I'm also a Son of Man, but I'm also a Son of God. I am now walking in what Jesus demonstrated could be lived through this marvelous new covenant of mercy and forgiveness that I can have boldness to come before His throne and boldness in the day of judgment and that I should open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now think about that. That we may come boldly before His throne, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need, and because He loves us, we have boldness in the day of judgment, and because of that, Brother Jeff, we also have great plainness or boldness of speech. We're willing to proclaim that we are accepted in the Beloved. And that gives us that wonderful, excellent knowledge, that threefold thing of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, which is now housed in the reality of our walk with God. Each one of you are the containers, the agency, the temple of His dominion. A temple that's not made with hands, but a temple that was made and designed His handiwork something you have dominion over, and now He resides in the temple because your body is indeed that temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the walking manifestation of your Father. You through sonship are revealing light, love, and truth in relational aspects through the competence of grace. And sometimes the only way to be competent towards people is to be merciful and to be forgiving. You can't make an inroad any way. The only other way friendships and relationships last is if they're based on friendship. If I turn to you and ask for your forgiveness, well, we all say, well, then you're supposed to give it to me. Yet I find many people that will not give forgiveness when you ask for it. You can ask for forgiveness and they hold on to their grudge and their hurt and their bitterness instead of moving in the competence to maintain the relationship, to maintain the marriage between Christ and the church, between a man and the woman. And thus, the love that makes one is the manifestation of those two coming together. So, this is what we have to say tonight. Isn't that amazing that you gave Him dominion over the works of His hands? Man has dominion over the works of creation, Yes, He does. Paul would say in Romans 8 that all the creation is moaning and, and travailing, groaning for the manifestations of the sons of God. And those are those who realize, I am my Father's idea. I'm here because of God. It is He that brought me into the kingdom for such a time as this. We may think as uh, Nick did in John 3, that after Mr. and Mrs. Demas got together, they had a son, Nick Odemus, and he thought his origination came from 
uh, Daddy Demas and Mama Demas. Well, I'm here to tell you, Jesus said, how do you not know that you came from me long before you ever came through the carnality and the procreation of your mom and dad, the X and the Y chromosome, the man and the woman coming together? Because that's the only thing that produces more opportunities for God to design His intention in a mother's womb where He's fearfully and wonderfully putting together the absolute character, gifts, and talents of His next idea that is going to be born into this world. You see, everything living has come from God. My design came from God. My, my character, my personality, my thoughts, the way I was put together. And remember that the universe, whether you're talking about, uh, as Job did, Orion, Pleiades, or Archetus, uh, that God pointed out to Job, if that's God's computer, and if you're born in the sign of Sagittarius, and the seven moons uh, align with Mars, if that's how God figures out and makes you what you are, that's okay with me. That doesn't make me a worshiper of astrology, because I believe all astrology is in His power. It's His gift. It could be His personal computer to design your temperament, your character, your talents, and your giftedness. Who knows? I'll ask God about that uh, in my next big step because I am going to be born out of the body of this death into eternity as a redeemed spirit soul at my next iteration, uh, my next graduation as I walk with the Master. I wish you'd say amen, because that's good truth right there. So look at it. Dominion over His hands, you put all under His feet. God has now subdued everything. Subdue the earth. Remember, that was part of it. The earth doesn't get to run crazy. He subdues the earth. And it's up to you and I to subdue the earth. That not by war, but rather by love. We subdue the earth. We bring it under the proper prospects of harmony, seasons, and we let this design bless us and keep us as we live in the knitting together of love, the harmony of love, the marriage again of a man and a woman who started out as one, were made to, and then were brought together in marriage to be made one again of Christ in the church. His love that keeps us together. Now, are there times when the body and people have trouble in the flesh? Of course there is. But it's mercy and forgiveness that bonds you back together because your love is worth it. It's good for the children. It's good that there are strong families on the face of the earth, not only in America but all around the world. That's why our strong families of a man and a woman raising up their sons and their daughters, their daughters and their sons, their generations, and the honor and the respect of the elderly and those that have given their life, the younger women being taught by the women with experience in age in seasons where they can learn how to live as God on the face of the earth. That is the calling of, Paul said, godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. We had godness in Jesus Christ, but now we're called to godliness all over. All of mankind is brought into this revelation and in this ideal of the illumination of life. And the illumination of life is to accept what He really did for us. To accept it, confess it, say it, live it, and if it's presently not manifesting, then call things that are not as though they were. Remember, He's told them when they said, if you have the faith of God, you could say unto this mountain, Be thou removed into yonder sea, and it should obey your voice as you should bow your knee and confess 
that if Jesus Christ is Lord, help me to be Lord over my own life and help me to be Lord in this life, not, not, not uh, bossing people around, but understanding the harmony and the very flow of life that I've been brought into, which comes from the Holy Spirit. Very important that we live this. Now look at this, under His feet, that God takes knowledge of man. Yes, He does. God takes knowledge of of man. When uh, Saul of Tarsus, who had met Jesus earlier as the rich young ruler, had gotten his letters from the Sanhedrin court away from the teaching of uh, Gamaliel the Great to go and bind and persecute and execute anyone who called on the name of Jesus. When he was knocked down to the ground by the great light and heard the voice, immediately the voice that spoke to him said, Saul, Saul, knew him by name. God had knowledge of him. Knew what he was doing, where he was going, and that he thought he was doing a service to God. Why persecuteth thou me? Because when you've done it to the least of one of my little ones, Listen to what God said from heaven to the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. You do it to the least of one of my little ones, you are doing it unto me. You're attacking me when you attack them. They are what I am and I am what they are. We are God's design. We are His thoughts and His spirit manifest in reality, in creation. When you've done it to the least of one of my little ones, You have done it unto me. So if someone is trying to pick on you, yes, they're picking a fight with Almighty God, and I do not recommend that. And that was ultimately the wisdom of Gamaliel, that if these men that were standing and preaching and teaching, if they were of men and it was just a man-made movement, it would fizzle out on its own because it was man-made. But if this thing be of God, you're going to find yourself fighting against God. And on the road to Damascus, what Gamaliel had told Saul of Tarsus proved to be true. God came down and said, You're picking a fight with me, pal. Saul, Saul, why persecuteth thou me? Because touch one of my little ones and you are touching me. Because they are what I am. And because he is, I am tonight. I am in the I amness of my relationship. I am who I am today because of the grace of God that was bestowed upon me. See, that's what Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, that I am what I am by the grace of God. My I amness is based on what God is. And that is of God, that to be of God, that central, that centropy of God literally is the reward of, of me discovering who I am and the grace that was bestowed upon, bestowed upon me. Pleh, bestowed. I need my upper lip to work with me tonight. Praise God. Bestowed upon me was not in vain, so I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. So I found I needed way more forgiveness, way more mercy for me and for others. And thankfully today, I'm still growing in that grace and knowledge because now we have the four horse riders that's the next generation that are already manifesting and they are now guiding the church into their generation. I've done the very best I could. Now as a bishop, I can help them and direct them and with the belief of our elders here in the church, good godly men, like David Hawkins, we are literally seeing these young men blossom in their ministry, growing in grace, growing in the anointing, preparing to reach this next generation, already showing the influence and the handiwork of the Almighty that He has designed within each and every one of them. So when you get to hear a Michael, a Brent, a Josh, or an A.J., You're hearing what God had in mind. That is the mindfulness of God coming through the sonship of these young ministers that are now 
been lit with the eternal flame of the Holy Ghost and fire. And yes, when they preach, they are flames of fire from the altar of God. Their iniquity has been purged. And like in Isaiah, they're sent into the nations that they are redeemed and carrying the message of the Messiah. It's a beautiful thing to behold. Now see, if we say we believe that, then our faith must have works. That's why we're handed the, 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 the control, the leadership, and the ministry off to their capable hands. They are able to do what God trusted them with. You see, it's an acknowledgement on our part that God is continuing the gospel. The good news will go on, and it goes through the next generation as He designed it should be. It's not going to end with my death. He's not going to come back before I die. Sorry, I don't want to blow your bubble up, but my job is to pass the gospel off and for them to now lead the church through the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ in the way that they should go. And I hope you can say amen to that. Takes knowledge of Him. Now watch this. Then it also said in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes that thou makest account of Him. Now He sent Jesus, our firstborn brethren, to be accountable for all the sins of mankind. And we are to account this is righteousness. That God is not imputing our sins and trespasses against us. As Paul said in Romans 3, going into 4, and all the way into 5, that thou makest account, thou accountest of Him. And that accounting caught up in the person of the supreme sacrifice of the firstborn Son of God, the prototype of whom Adam was made in the similitude of. That was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's just so amazing that if the effect of the first man, Adam, and this is what's so, so amazing about the church, the sin and the fall of the first man, Adam, we universally say that that affected all of mankind. And then we put Jesus up on this pedestal because God our Father is may accountist, making an account with Him that the account is going to get paid finally. And He takes it all out on Jesus and He dies. Well, if Adam's sin affected the whole creation, how much more the life of Jesus Christ affected all of mankind? Past, present, and future. His death is the payment forever. That one death, the truth is, we've got to get to the place that no one else has to die. God has the one death that He made account of Him. And that's how we account to ourselves the righteousness of God. We see that this faith that Jesus came in and struggled with in the Garden of Gethsemane, that He struggled to pay. And He said, if there was another way to do it, God, please do it. But God said, nope, it's all going to be laid on you, Jesus. And He said, not what I will, but thy will be done. And then we have the beautiful statement as Paul leads us into why the law came, that every mouth may be stopped. And as the love chapter said, that all tongues would cease. Stop with the death language. Stop cursing yourself. Stop downing yourself. Stop talking long enough to learn a better language and speech. Learn the language of life and leave the language of death behind you. That's why it says uh, uh, that now to him that worketh, we find that grace is reckoned to give us eternal life and that we should account, we should make account because of what was laid on Jesus that God did not impute our sins against us. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Let's take an account of that because God took an account with the firstborn son 
and laid on Him the iniquity of us all. All in the past, all in the present, and all in the future. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Isn't that glorious? And then God has placed man here for travail to be exercised. Did God sent man in travail and suffering and they are exercised in there because when you suffer, you seek. You begin to question. You begin to look for the peace and the joy that you know you were designed for. When things are not as they should be, when the world is out of order, you want to get it back in order. You want it to get back in peace. That is why the chaos of war is so detrimental on people. You can imagine what the Ukrainians are. We can't really, that their entire life is out of order and in destruction. Every day is an absolute chaotic mess. Nothing is normal anymore. Nothing is dependable anymore. That's why war is not the answer. Peace is the answer. Peace on the earth and goodwill towards mankind. That's what the angels announced to those shepherds abiding over their, over their flocks in the night. And they came and declared to them that the Savior in the fullness of time had arrived and He has been born of a woman, of a virgin that was prophesied of and began to be alluded to back at Isaiah 7, 14. There it was that man through this struggle and through the suffering, and through tribulation, would enter into the kingdom of God. See, uh, you shall have tribulation in this life, but be of good cheer. The overcoming Spirit of Christ lives on the inside of you. And in that overcoming, you'll begin to realize the victory, the boldness. That's why we become boldly through the throne of grace, and we see as he said in Ecclesiastes, that God put this hope of eternal life. He set eternity in our hearts. In Ecclesiastes 3, 12. Now, it says the world in the King James Version, but the real word there is eternity. Eternity lives inside your heart. That's why the Bible says, What saith God's relationship? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. The essence of eternity and the throne that Jesus wants to live on is right here in your heart. And the word is nigh thee. It's in thy mouth and in thy heart. With the confession from belief of the heart that if God our Father raised Jesus from the dead and took Him and exalted Him to the right hand of God, if God my Father raised Jesus from the dead, will He not also raise me from the dead? Because I'm no less a son than Jesus Christ. I'm no less an heir. I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You see the equality that is leveled again if we will accept it. And the church shuns this revelation. They turn from it as if something is being stolen or something is being robbed. Oh, we can't say that. Uh, that's so sacrosanct. We make Jesus so much other than what we are. No, He was just like what we are. And that was the miracle of it. When Joseph and Mary held that baby, they looked at Him and said, Oh my, He looks just like us. He is just like us. And yet He's the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world. And He has a star guiding people to where He was born. Amazing. And He looks just like us. He's a carpenter's son. And yet at times there are glimpses of eternal glory. At the age of 13, left behind at the temple, as He literally is going for His priestly bar mitzvah. Not just a bar mitzvah, but for the priesthood. And He quoted the first five books of the Bible. And he answered their theological questions and asked questions. And yes, the truth is, 
He passed the test. And one of the people questioning him was a younger Nick. A, no, a younger Nick. Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Demas's son was one of the 70 elders at that time and remembered this young upstart. And that priest, Nick O. Demas. I'm Kevin L. Kello. He's Nick O. Demas. Mr. and Mrs. Demas's son remembered this 13-year-old fella that quoted the first five books of the Bible and asked and answered questions concerning the priesthood. And he passed. He passed. Which would only prepare him for the day of his death when the high priest were in his garment, disqualified himself, and Jesus was the immediate uh, fulfillment, replacement taking his place because he had disqualified himself by rending his garment. And Jesus said, that's okay, I'm ready to step in. And he stepped right in, right in the right moment, and he died for the sins of the entire world. Not just the nation, but the entire world. Thanks be unto God. Our forgiveness is sure. Our forgiveness is real. Our forgiveness is eternal. Our forgiveness is everlasting. Our forgiveness comes from God and it has affected everything else. Now His name is Emmanuel. Get used to it. The interpretation from the revelation, the mystery revealed of godliness is that God is with us. Stop excluding people and begin to involve them in the concluded manifest love of God. Include them in the promise. Include them in the family. Knit them together. Don't push them out because they don't attend your name brand of church. Include them because of the love that God gives. It's this love that is the manifestation that we are His sons and daughters. By this love shall all men know that you're my disciple. Love others. Forgive others. Practice mercy. Show grace, receive grace, and give grace. This is the new covenant. This is the life of virtue. This is the good fruit that God asks that we bear, the fruit of our tree. And this is how we should know one another. Not by the brand names of religion. Not by the, the brand names of who you follow. You can tell if a person loves or not, if they've met him or not. They don't have to attend this church or listen to yours truly. They have to meet Him, know Him, be regenerated by Him. As Jesus said in Matthew 19, the regeneration. As His apostles said, uh, the Apostle Paul in uh, Titus 3, the washing of regeneration. That blood covenant that literally has given us the reality and the awakening and the consciousness that we are sons and daughters of the Almighty God. That we are heirs and joint heirs. Nearer to God, nearer I cannot be. For in Christ Jesus, I am as near as He, because I was chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. That's how He had a discussion with us. Let us. He involved us. And then He says, It's my turn to take on the robe of humanity. So look at it now. He set eternity in our hearts. Isn't that beautiful? So look at this. Back to Hebrews 2, 7. I quoted two verses. Welcome to my opening statement of this theological journey with Bishop Keller. Welcome tonight. Welcome. This is a good choice. You're going to learn the Bible. You're going to learn the grace and mercy of God. You're going to learn the greatest of all of faith and hope is charity. Charity. Out of an unfeigned heart. There are no disguises. Uh, there's nothing feigned about this. This is very genuine, authentic love. Unconditional love from God. Superior love. Wonderful love. In Hebrews 2, 7, said it like this. You made Him. Just a shade lower than the Almighty for a moment when Jesus made Himself of no reputation and had a soul that was just as temptable, that had a mind 
from will and emotion that could have been swayed just as much as any human on the face of the earth. Otherwise, it was not possible that he could be tempted like we are. If he had a soul that was super energized by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the authority of God, how can he relate to me? He doesn't know what it's like, but yet he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. And in that equality of soul, he showed us that the Holy Spirit could give us enough competence to see the evil, resist the evil, and not yield and succumb to it. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. Yes, he was crowned with a crown of thorns, so he could wear a crown of eternal life, but did he keep the crown on his head? No, according to the Bible, he crowned us with crowns, and that is the crown of the anointing. Thou anointest my head with oil. That's the crown that God gives a literally from your heart a renewed mind. A renewed mind to think like he thinks. The very mind of Christ that we do have, that the apostle said he did have, and that, that you should allow to be in your life. Let the same mind that was in the man Christ Jesus allow it also to be in you. Let your heart renew your mind. It's not your mind changing your heart. It's your heart that renews your mind. You literally don't get a born-again brain, but you do get a regenerated heart, and it begins to send information upstairs and say, okay, that's got to be worked out. Old information and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, every vain imagination... That's got to be cast out, and we've not to the now learn the new information. That's why your tongue and your old carnal thinking has to be paused long enough to be regenerated in a new way of thinking, in the spirit of your mind, in the spirit of your mind. Yes, we're taking the spirit of regeneration in our heart, and we're taking it upstairs to the brain to have a spiritual mind. The, Paul would call it spiritual understanding. That God would bless you with all spiritual understanding because the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And that understanding that Solomon talked about was largeness of heart. You can be like the Grinch that stole Christmas and when you can see that all the hoo-hooters and hap-happers and all the people down there and in that little town, that they loved each other and they sang anyway without all the trappings and the presence and his heart grew five times larger. That's what happens. God gives you an enlarged heart. He gives you largeness of heart. He gives you a greater capacity to have more love, more compassion, more kindness to reach more people and thus you begin to cross the boundaries and go into all the world, all the nations, to the four corners, the farthest reaches of north, south, east, and west. Ha, ah, hallelujah. And did set him over the works of thy hands or creation. Amen. Thou hast put all things in, subject, in, in subjection under his feet, for in that he put in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Because that's why he left the ministry to us. Because now it's our job to forget, to, to continue and to even finish all that he began to both do and teach. That work of spreading the gospel, that work of going into further regions, that going into all the world, the occupational force of the church that's learned to rule and reign in the earth through one, Christ Jesus our Lord. We are now ruling and reigning. We now have the authority and the competence and the ability of love which is operating to me as grace with mercy and forgiveness. And that's what I give back out the grace of mercy and forgiveness 
through the actuation of God's love. Isn't that beautiful? And we see Jesus, who is now the head of the church, the preeminent one. He's the head of the body. That's why John died and Jesus went on and lived for that three and a half years because he instantiated himself as the head of the church. And again, that has little to do with what the name of the ministry you participate at. If you are presently worshiping, communing, praying, and fulfilling purpose and consciousness, wherever you are, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He is the preeminent one in all things. He's the one who runs my life, and He should be the one who runs your life. That's why the prophecy can only take you so far until you learn it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if He can't lead you, He can't guide you, then we're not preaching a true gospel. And yet we get all afflicted and rubbed wrong when someone says they're being led of the Spirit. That's what's supposed to happen. Jesus is Lord, not Kevin. Jesus is Lord. Allow people their liberty in, gra in grace. Allow them to be the sons and daughters of God, of our Father, that He said we would be. Why? For the suffering of death, when God laid on Him the iniquity of us all, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God... Now, if He tasted it by grace, we've been tasting and seeing through the milk of the Word that the Lord is good. He tasted grace, now we taste grace. And if Jesus had to taste grace for every one of us, that He, by the grace of God, should taste death. See, He tasted our death so that we could taste life. He's bringing us out of death into life. He came from life and tasted death. And death couldn't hold Him. He's tasted death for all of us. Now let's us taste life. That's why you receive the engrafted Word which is able to save your soul. That's why that engrafted word, that implanted word, taste and see that the Lord is good. You taste the life that He gave you by tasting your death. He tastes death, He's resurrected from it. I come out of death and I'm resurrected into life to taste the milk of the word, the bread of the word, and grow into the meat of the word, the whole staple and the whole... A menu of God that now lives in my spirit. Line upon line, precept upon precept, and then in the meat, here a little bit and there a little bit. We drink milk at every meal, praise God. We have the bread of heaven, the living bread, that we now know what it is. We're no longer saying, what is it? We're no longer saying, manna. We know that Jesus literally gave His body and gave His blood that we should drink and partake of Him. And that is the staple, the menu, the breakfast, lunch, and dinner of the church of Jesus Christ. The milk, the bread, and the meat. Literally, our Passover, our Pentecost, our tabernacles. That is how we're living. For it became Him, Jesus Christ, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things? To bring all the rest of us, many sons and daughters, unto this same glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now if he learned obedience by the things that he suffered, in Hebrews in this book says he did. That he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. How much did he suffer? Oh, he was called everything but what he was. Illegitimate. Uh, they cast him out. They tried to kill him some 11 times before they got it done the 12th time through Pontius Pilate. He was so much suffering that his sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood under such anxiety and, and, and uh, 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 suffering that his capillaries burst until his blood came through his uh, perspiration. And yet... He said, not my will, I'm not here to do it my way, 
I'm going to do the Father's will. And God sufficiently planted him on a cross, laid on him the dirt and the filth of all of our iniquity, and then harvested eternal life from Jesus out of a borrowed tomb when he was risen on the third day. And that first he descended into the lower parts of evil and hell and preached the gospel to those saints to set them free as well. God's love is amazing. It's absolutely stunning. The captain of our salvation now bids us to take the charge, as he says in John 20, as the Father has sent me, so now I send you. Now you're the witness. Now you're the light. Now you're the truth. Now you're the grace. Now you're the mercy. Now you're the forgiveness. Now you manifest the love of God. And not just the knowledge, not just the intellectualism, not just scholarship. All that gets heady and high-minded. You're cruising for a bruising if you stay on that road. Love passes knowledge. We have crowned knowledge king in the church, and it's not. It is one of the most risky, nasty things. That's why people divide. That's why they're still arguing over this doctrine, that doctrine, because we don't have enough love to get along anymore. Everyone wants to know who's right. Well, I'll tell you what, let me make it easy for you. I'm wrong, but I'm loved of God. I'm loved by God. I'm not the smartest person. I'm not the most intellectual. I'm not the most deep or, or revelatory. But I do know that God loves me. And I know that God loves you. And I know that God forgives sins. And if you have a fault, we're going to cover you. We're not going to run you out of the church. That's the time we cover you in the church. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. That's the fervent charity that we cover each other with. We don't make people leave church because they're having a battle. That's when we all take our love and really cover them. When they're that sick, they really need all of us nurses and all of us physicians to see to it that they get well again and that that sin is not their destruction. That is the heart of every real born-again believer. Amen. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause... Now, look at this. This is amazing. Jesus is not ashamed of me. And I shouldn't be ashamed to be what He is because He's not ashamed to be what I am. He was never too holy to help. He was never too righteous to forgive. He never used the book of Proverbs on me and showed me, well, this is why I'm not helping Kevin uh, because wisdom shows that uh, I don't have to help Kevin right now. You know, you may be wise enough not to give to someone in need, That proves that you're not loving enough to give to someone in need. I don't want to hide behind scriptures when my motivation is love. I don't want to hide behind sounding wise to not do what God said. This is exactly what the Pharisees taught the others to not take care of their parents. Give the church a great big sum of money and that way you don't have to take care of your elderly mom and dad. You don't have to nurse them back to health. Just pay us off And then we'll say, well, they've done the right thing uh, just so they don't have to take care of their parents. Your parents brought you into the world and if you're really people of God, and I've seen people in this church absolutely do it. I've seen Curtis and Lynn Wilson absolutely take care of their parents in their homes, in their life, to the very last day. And that's exactly the way God said it should be. To the point that they made a place for their living in their home and nurse them into their next step of faith all the way through. God has an intention. And you can't give a sum of money to the church to not take care of your mom and dad. That's crazy. That's breaking the commandment of God. And remember out there, no matter who you think you are, you are to honor your mother and father. And especially honor your mother and father that are in the Lord. You may not always like what they do, You may not always love what they do, but you are always called by God to honor your mother and father. Amen. All right. (laughs) Uh, He's not ashamed to call me brethren, saying, I will declare your name. Now we can say, well, 
that's Jesus declaring the Father's name to us. Well, what if He declared Kevin's name to the body of Christ? That's how acceptance and love, that's how influence and, and God's grace can let you dovetail and grow in the body of Christ. He can declare your name. This is my prophet, hear ye him. This is my son, hear ye him. That was God the Father declaring Jesus uh, to the body, uh, both at the baptism and on Mount Transfiguration. If you're going to listen to somebody, God declared His name to His brethren. And God could declare your name to the body of Christ that you should be listened to. And that's God's choice for the church to listen to you. Amen. And in, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in my Father. Because if you exalt yourself, you shall be abased or humbled. But if you humble yourself, the Bible says, humble, humble yourself. Did you hear that? But if you humble yourself, you will be exalted in due time. Father knows how to do it. Amen. Look at this, so beautiful. And again, I and the church, behold, I and the children which God hath given me, for as much then as the children partook of, 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 of a body, of flesh and blood, He also took part of what we were the whole of. He took our bone, and He took our flesh, but He came with the blood of heaven. Because the life is not the blood, but the life was in the blood. His blood is the blood that forgives all sin. Not just the blood of mankind, it was a living blood, a life-giving blood. Amen. That through death He might destroy him that had the power of darkness and death in their language and evil, desperately wicked and deceitful above all things in our hearts and we were killing ourselves with wrong and dark ideas. And deliver them who through the fear of death and the speaking of death and the using of uh, the death language were all our lifetime subject to bondage. And we'd gotten to the place that let us eat and drink because all we can think about is our dying and there's no hope of living. Jesus turned all that around. Jesus changed every bit of that. For truly He took not on Him the nature of angels, but He took on Him, look at this, the seed of Abraham, the seed of belief, that belief that was accounted unto Him for His salvation, that faith that was accounted that had works, that he believed God. And his faith and his connection to the Father was so clear that as he tasted death for us, we get to taste the life that he gave to us as he tasted our death. In the exchange, I am reaping what God sowed in Christ on the cross. I'm not reaping what I sowed. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Uh, I'm not here to reap what I sowed. I'm reaping what Christ benefited me in the atonement. He daily, daily loads me with benefits. Daily I'm benefited by God. Daily I live the abundance of God. Daily He gives good success. Daily He prospers the works of my hands. You want something blessed? Give me to lay my hands on it. It's blessed because He said He would. And He taught me that I could decree a thing and it would be established unto me because He wants to honor my words as His magnifying Himself through my life. I am the magnification of God the Father. I am the magnification of Him fathering forth in love, in illumination. Blessed be what He demonstrated to us through His firstborn Son, Jesus Christ. Blessed be God. But He took on Him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved Him. It was only right that He took on what we were. Because He's the one that talked us into it to start with 
and gave us these bodies to dwell in. He said, okay, now in the fullness of time, it's my turn to show them that those people all in the world, those are my ideas. They're my people. He shall save His people from their sin. We are His people. We are His offspring. We carry His Spirit. That's why everything that brings forth of its own kind, it behooved Him to be made like unto His brethren, that He might be, look at it now, merciful, faithful, high priest in things pertaining to the Father and make reconciliation by tasting our death for the sins of the people. For in that He Himself has suffered being tempted, He is able to succor. We don't use that word anymore. Help, aid, relieve, and deliver. Help, aid, relieve, and deliver them that are tempted. That's how you get out. You go up. The way out is up. Look up from whence cometh your help. You can't go to the north, south, east, or west. You certainly don't want to go down. That's why the Bible says that the way of life is above to all them who want to escape from help beneath. The way of life is above to all them who want to escape from hell beneath. That's why the way out of your temptation is up into Him. Because He knows what it feels like to be tempted because He made Himself as common as you and I, as normal as you and I, because He is what we were and we are what He is. And the reward is you discovering what His intention, design, and creation had in mind when He fearfully made you and created you in the lower parts of the earth in your mother's womb. And now it's your turn. And sometimes we need a Mordecai to tell Hadassah, look how beautiful you are. Enter the beauty contest. You can become Miss Ahasuerus. You can become Miss Cyrus. You could become its Artaxerxes. I know it's a tough name, but it's still worth it. You could be the queen. You're beautiful enough. And sure enough, Hadassah entered the beauty contest. She won and became Esther. And through that, God favored the cupbearer and get granted that Jerusalem could be repatriated and the temple be rebuilt. Because, again, he was favoring his beautiful Jewish wife. And that's just one story out of that. I know we have the Feast of Purim. I know that she thwarted the evil machinations of, uh, 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 of the uh, 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 Agagite uh, uh, Haman. I got all that. But he, there was something greater going on as well. When you realize God brought you into this life, and He used your mom and dad to give you your earth suit. That, that, that's how I got this humanity, this carnality. But I've been around from the very beginning. I was in that first praising service when all the sons of God, morning stars were singing, and all the sons of God shouted for glory. Because when we saw the image, the likeness, and the housing of the Father through the prototype, the protopieces, Jesus Christ, the first before all, we all said amen to it. No wonder we bear witness to Him. We already agreed in the beginning. Yeah, we'll be made like Him, just like Him, and He is just like us. That's why we come boldly before the throne of grace. That's why we have boldness in the day of judgment. And that's why we speak boldly as we ought to speak and that utterance should be given to us because it's all being regenerated by the reality of the power of God's love. Now, that's one way to say it, and uh, I want to read it again in an updated present version, and I always love saying this while Michael's here, because I think it's right down his alley. So I'm going to be rolling this ball towards him, and I hope I get a strike, because Timothy Jennings wrote an uh, updated New Testament with the redemption of the soul in mind. That we're entering into the phase of the church of the living God where the virtue of the soul and it being redeemed from all its darkness and brokenness and 
and fractured and, and failings and coming out of the darkness of a pit, that God is showing the good fruit of the church. When you go meet someone, don't meet them trying to prove how powerful you are. Meet them in love and let them see how virtuous you are. It's the virtue of God. People know who you are by the fruit that you bear. It's the virtue of the soul where the manifestation of redemption is evidenced. That's when you become literally the planting of the Lord, a tree of righteousness. And then they might find out where you go to church. Why well, go to this little church down in the holler over there in West Gastonia somewhere. You, you got to turn here, turn there. What's the name of it? Oh my God, the name of the church is two miles long, but the people are great and they're loving. So I'm going to read to you again. Hopefully, right, Righteous Brothers in an uh, Unchained Melody. What's the name of that song? Uh, you know, the Righteous Brothers. You know, I'll break into singing if somebody don't help me out. Anyway, God did not choose angels to rule over the future kingdom about which we are speaking. God gave it to His sons and daughters. For it is written somewhere, well, it's not somewhere, it's been written in Job, it's been written in Psalms, it's been written in Proverbs, uh, it's been written all in the... Why are humans so important to you? Because Or the Son of Man. Because humans are the manifestation of God our Father. Why do you care about them and Him? You positioned Him, the firstborn, a little lower than the angels, but crowned Him with glory uh, of your character and the honor of revealing your principles. He made everything subject to His rule. In putting all things under His authority, God the Father left nothing on earth that is not governed by, yes, believe it or not, humanity. We're where we are because of choices we're making. We're where we are because of choices we're making. That's why you should be led of the Spirit. Sometimes you just need to refrain and wait upon the Lord and renew your strength. We don't have to make choices because uh, the, the government or mankind is. We wait upon the Lord and we renew our strength. And then we get to mount up with wings as eagles. Then we get to run and not be weary. Then we get to walk and faint not. But we're waiting on God's timing. We have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit within us. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? I just think that's absolutely beautiful. Amen. And uh, you made everything subject to the rule of love. In putting all things under His authority, God left nothing on earth that is not presently governed by humanity. Yet presently, we do not see all creation restored to human rule because all of human rule has to come under the headship of Jesus' rule, the head of all humanity, which is His body, and we ultimately, by faith, call it the church. Amen. So we see that He was crowned with glory and honor to can give us a continuing light, uh, a light without variableness, revealing God's character and honoring and vindicating God's methods, principles of selfless love. Selfless love, sacrificing love, because he voluntarily chose to die rather than use his power or his spiritual ability to save himself so that he might have the graciousness to save all of mankind. Not just one nation, but all the nations. So he might consume death and taste death so that we could taste life and taste all of life through the grace of the new covenant. In healing our minds and characters, many sons and daughters come to realize that it was necessary that God, who created us, would do this for us. From, from whom, through everything exists, making the source of healing and the remedy of our salvation, uh, literally in self-sacrificing love manifested and then perfected. Thus, when Christ chose to love rather than to act, 
uh, to save himself, he eradicated the death-causing survival of the fittest, get ahead at any cost of mankind. Both the one who heals the minds and the characters of human beings and those whose minds and characters are healed are of the same family. They show the real work of God the Father as He magnifies Himself through their living. Amen. So Jesus is not ashamed to be identified with them in an equality, calling them His brothers and sisters. I reveal your character to my brothers and sisters in the presence of humanity. I sing your praises. I will put my trust in Him. And not just me, but I'm going to stand here with all the brothers and sisters that have that calling to be the children of God. And since the children are human with flesh and blood, it was the fullness of time that He came too and became human with flesh and bone so that by His death He might reveal the truth about God. Consuming selfishness with love, destroy Him that through the power of a dark and death language, through the deceitfulness and the desperate wickedness of the heart, was killing Himself, teaching them to pause and learn the language of life, thus every mouth being stopped so that guilt could no longer be what is destroying us from the inside and life could be giving us eternity from our hearts. For surely it is not to angels that He provides the salvation, which is the remedy to our sin, but to children of Abraham. For this reason... He had to become one of us, completely human in every way, in order to purge humanity of selfishness, enlighten the darkened minds of people with truth about God so they would trust in Him, and know that He is the mediator. He is the very life link to being restored back to your Father. And thus, bring mankind back into the unity of the Father in heart, mind, and character, because he has himself suffered uh, with temptation. Humanity will trust that he truly knows how to help those that are being tempted. That's what I had to say tonight, and there's one more place. What are we waiting on till all the rest of us? Hebrews chapter 4, last verse, 13. We're waiting till all come in the unity of the faith until we all come in. Not just me. My coming in is to spread the good news that everyone else can come in. Till, 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 till this happens. We're going to be occupying, going to the four corners of the world. We've got to take our ideas, put it in shoe leather, and go see people. Go connect with people. Love to love. Humanity to humanity. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure, stature, and fullness of Christ. Equality with God our Father. I don't think it robbery. I think it's grace. I don't think it robbery. I think it's mercy. I don't think it robbery. I think it's forgiveness. And I think God has made all of us of one because He is the reason we're alive, and He's the reason I have the hope of eternal life. I pray you've been blessed tonight. I pray that you've heard this and found something regenerative, something that reminds you that the mystery of God is now manifest. The mystery of godliness. God is, was seen through Jesus and manifest His light, now God is in you to be seen through you, to be magnified through you, to be revealed to you, to be shown unto angels, to be preached unto the Gentiles, to be believed on in the world. And yes, at the end of our journey, our course, to be received up into glory. That's my next big step. When I cross over, that I'll be uh, literally born out of death as my older brother Jesus showed me, as I seek to walk in His same steps. So, that's the love that I wanted to share with you tonight. 
I hope I stayed on subject. I hope that was clear enough. I hope that was straight enough. I hope you get the gist of it. Uh, if you have something to give to the church because it's in your heart, then we have subsplash on the Gathering Echo. Please go there and give and give as unto the Lord. Give heartily, the Bible said. And, of course, the tenth is just how you start out, and then you wind up giving everything you have. That's how that works. Anyway, leave your comments, leave your likes, leave your notes. Tell me what you did like, tell me what you don't like. You can call me an Elisha, you can call me an old ball head, and I won't ask for bears to come out and eat you. I'll pray for you, because when you get older, it could happen to you. But anyway, uh, send your love in my direction. I certainly send my love in yours. This is Bishop Kevin L. Kello at New Testament Church of the Firstborn. And let's lift our hands and say, I do love him because he first loved me. God bless you.